Welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Workshop at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. Our workshop speaker today is Nancy Chian. Nancy Chian is the James J. O'Connor Professor in the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. She's the founder of the China Econ Lab, an independent global voluntary organization that promotes rigorous research about the Chinese economy, as well as the China Cluster for Northwestern's Global Poverty Research Lab. She also leads the Development Economics Initiative for Kellogg. Professor Chien's research lies at the intersection of development economics, political economy, and economic history. Her work examines the economic determinants and consequences of formal institutions, such as elections, and cultural norms, such as gender preference and racial identity. She uses economic frameworks and empirical evidence to resolve historical puzzles, such as the causes of the great Chinese and Soviet famines, or the presence of local democracy within automatic autocratic regimes. Her presentation today is entitled, Discrimination and State Capacity, Evidence from World War II U.S. Army Enlistment. And this is joint work with Marco Tellini. Following the presentation, we'll have a formal discussion. Stephen White, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Syracuse University, to provide some comments. During Professor Chien's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or Q&A box. I'll be monitoring questions as the talk goes on. And without further ado, I give you Professor Nancy Chien. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the introduction and for having me. And thank you in advance, Stephen, for discussing the paper. So the title of the paper is called Discrimination in State Capacity, Evidence from World War II U.S. Army Enlistment. Uh, this is a joint work with Marco Tabellini, who is an assistant professor at Harvard Business School. Uh, we're actually in the process of revising the paper, so any comments or suggestions or questions that people have today would be super useful. And I appreciate that most people in the audience are from political science rather than economics, and that's just going to be, you know, extra useful to us in making our paper better. So let me get on with it. You know, why do we study this topic? Well, for several reasons, you know, state capacity which we define as the ability of a government to accomplish policy goals, it's central for economic growth. This has been established in a new branch of literature and political economy, starting with Besley and Person in 2009. Now, typically, you know, people think about state capacity as taxes uh, and the ability to impose taxes. You know, I'm thinking back to Alfred Tilly's work, but it really, it's, um, but it's actually broader than that, right? So Margaret Levy, who's a political scientist at Stanford pointed out, uh, was one of the people who pointed out that the motivation of soldiers, both voluntary and conscripted during wars is essential to the functions of the state during the war. You need your soldiers to be motivated to fight. Even if you can forcibly draft them, it still helps the war effort if they're motivated towards the war. And at the, at the same time, the literature on state capacity has pointed out the discrimination and disenfranchisement could reduce motivation. Sorry, I'm misspeaking. So discrimination and disenfranchisement could reduce motivation. And this follows from a couple of places. So theoretically, Besley and Person have shown that inclusive institutions are associated with higher state capacity. And Margaret Levy's work, you know, she talks about the role of trust and having a stake in the game in terms of the motivation of soldiers. Now, as of now, there is no direct evidence, like rigorous empirical evidence on the causal impact of discrimination on state capacity, uh, particularly the motor in, uh, in the context of soldiers' motivation during war. And this is where you know, our paper comes in. And you know, we're also obviously, you know, I. I don't need to say this to, a, uh, to any US audience. Obviously today, 
we are also just interested in the impact of discrimination in and of itself. So in economics, we have a huge literature about the impact of discrimination. And as of now, this has either focused on the direct effects of the person being discriminated against, or we look at social costs. But when we look at social costs, it's through labor misallocation. So one of the things we're doing with our study is to highlight a new way in which discrimination can impose strong social costs, right? By reducing state capacity during the time of war. All right, so empirically, our paper does a very straightforward exercise. We're gonna to try to estimate the causal impact of racial discrimination on black volunteer enlistment during World War II. Why World War II? Uh, for a lot of reasons. So by the end, uh, I think it's important to first point out that by the end of the war, more African-Americans enlisted than white Americans. But this was due to a huge massive recruitment effort targeted at black soldiers, black men, starting in mid 1942. At the beginning of the war, involvement in the war was very controversial within the black community. Decades of severe discrimination and effective disenfranchisement had discouraged black men from joining, right? Uh, and I'll give you precise examples and what who was saying what, you know, at the time. On top of that, there was a lot of disappointment after World War I. So for the First World War, the Black community was very motivated to fight, and the idea was that they would fight, demonstrate their usefulness to the state, and they would come back, and that would give them leverage to argue for more rights. But what actually happened is they came back from World War I, to face more discrimination, a deepening of Jim Crow. And there was a lot of disappointment 20 years later from um, this experience. All right, so here, I'll just give you a few quotes. Um, I think to me, these were useful uh, to sort of contextualize the emotions of the day, right? I wasn't alive during this time, no one here was. and. So the first quote is from James G. Thompson, uh, a young black man. And he says, should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Will things be better for the next generation and the peace to follow? Is this a kind of America I know worth defending? So this is from January 31st, 1942, a month and a half after Pearl Harbor, right? Right in the beginning of the war. George Schuyler, who was a well-known black journalist at the time said, why should Negroes fight for democracy abroad when they refuse democracy in every American activity except tax paying? And then there's this very famous um, poem by Langston Hughes, which I won't read because I'm um, very bad at poetry reading. Uh, I did competitive poetry reading in high school and I never won a single competition at any level <laughs> whatsoever. But I think the context of this poem is clear, right? Which is in the beginning of the war. And now remember at the beginning of the war, a lot of the things we now know about what Hitler, the Nazis were doing in Europe in the concentration camps, the Holocaust, what the Japanese were doing in Camp 731, we didn't know at the time. So this poem reflects what people, you know, what the knowledge at the time, and at the time, Hitler looked very similar to the American establishment. They were racist, they believed in eugenics theory. So, you know, what's the main empirical challenge? It's data limitations. How do we measure things? How to, and identification, right? Like, how do we identify the impact of the causal relationship between discrimination and motivation? We're worried about reverse causality. Maybe uh, Black enlistment patterns actually affect racism that they face in the community. We're worried about joint determination. Regional racism and black enlistment rates could both be outcomes of other variables, like I said earlier, World War I experience, industrialization, urbanization, so on and so forth. We can think about a lot of examples. So what we're going to do is we're going to address these limitations, these challenges by uh, getting using individual enlistment data from the US Army. So these are the induction records. These are the digitized data from induction cards of everyone who ever enlisted in the US Army during this period. And then we're going to construct a natural experiment. 
What we're going to do is we're going to compare enlistment rates of Black men before and after Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor triggered the war. Before Pearl Harbor, there was no war in the US. And we're going to see whether the increase in enlistment after Pearl Harbor, volunteer enlistment, was higher or lower in places with higher discrimination. So we have all the counties in the US, some of them have higher discrimination, some of them lower discrimination. And then when the war happens, we want to know how uh, enlistment rates, volunteer enlistment rates are related to discrimination, specifically places with higher discrimination, whether they experience a lower increase in volunteer enlistment for the war. And then, you know, this is our difference and difference, but actually there's a lot of other things that we wanna control for. Particularly there are things that vary by race, by county and over time. And to control for those, we're actually going to construct a triple difference. So we're going to, and another way to think about it is we're going to use, look at white Americans almost as a placebo, because if we're really capturing the effect of discrimination, we shouldn't find anything for white enlistment because you know this discrimination was towards Black Americans, not white Americans. And then in terms of mechanisms, what we really want to do is we want to separate the supply side discouragement a channel. So this is would be this would be like saying that uh, Black men were discouraged from enlisting in the army because of the discrimination they faced in life, the discrimination that their fathers and parents face historically, the discrimination that they anticipate in the army, right? This is all about discouragement and the supply of black men, men versus demand side effects. And here, what, what I mean by demand side effects is that one thing anecdotally anyways, that is a, that's a very common anecdote is that the army, particularly our local army boards in the South that were racist, often turned away Black men because they just didn't want Black men in the army, in the military. So it could be that this happened more in places that had more discrimination, and this is driving the results we find. So we want to rule this out, the demand side effect. And the way we're going to do that, uh, well, I'll talk about how we're going to do that later when we get there. And then if I have time, I'll show you additional evidence for Japanese Americans. So the data doesn't allow us to measure things as finely for Japanese Americans, but we'll show you the patterns are very consistent, that there's more higher enlistment rates in places where Japanese Americans face lower discrimination or disenfranchisement. All right. So what are our results? Let me preview it really quickly. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you that black enlistment is decreasing with discrimination. There's no relationship for white enlistment. It is robust to controlling for a lot of other factors that might be confounding our results. We find consistent patterns for Japanese Americans. We argue that our estimates reflect a discouragement effect of black men. And we do this because our results are similar when we control for draft enlistment rates of black men in the county in the year. And the idea is that if the army boards are just trying to keep black men out, it's actually easier for them to do it through the draft, which they have control over, than volunteer rates. Okay. And finally, uh, you know, what is the takeaway? Again, you know, the it's straightforward. Discrimination, racial discrimination reduced U.S. state capacity during World War II. And this is a new channel of how discrimination can be socially costly, very costly in principle. All right. I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, here I cite mostly the economics literature that's related, and we don't have so much time, so I'll just keep going. I'm going to talk about the historical background quickly. Assuming a lot of knowledge in the audience, if there, if you have any questions, you know, please ask. Um, the empirical, then I'll talk about the empirical strategy data results uh, and conclude. All right. So, like I said, I'm going to go pretty quickly over this. World War II happened at a time when racism was probably at its worst. It was the lowest, you can say the peak of Jim Crow, um, the lowest for the US. 
amongst the lowest times for the U.S. And it was for, racism was formal and informal. Uh, there was voting enfranchisement, separate but equal miscegenation, which means mixed marriages uh, are illegal. These are formal rules. There was informal racist racism, lynchings, job discrimination. It was all over the U.S., not just the South. And there was a lot of geographic variation within states. So to give you an example, the Ku Klux Klan is from Indiana. Even Boston had school segregation. And within each state, there's a lot of variation, Southern states, Northern states. Okay. Um, I have more quotes here. I'm not going to read them all just because we don't have that much time. The point of all these quotes is to say that, you know, at the beginning of the war, the view within the Black community amongst the leaders, union leaders, intellectuals, was that the Nazis and the Japanese weren't actually very different from the United States, uh, the government of the United States. Okay. Now, let me say something about the military. At the time of Pearl Harbor, um, the military essentially mirrored the rest of society as far as discrimination goes. The army enlisted black men, the Navy only mess men, uh, Air Corps and Marines did not take any black men at the onset of the war. So we're gonna be looking at the army, uh, which is most relevant for black men. Within the army, Every, there was full segregation, just like the rest of the world, housing, training, even the blood banks. So, you know, at the Battle of the Bulge, Churchill, Winston Churchill complained afterwards to Eisenhower that there was great inefficiencies because white officers desperately in need of blood were not allowed to get blood from black men. It was very extreme. So the fighting units were mostly, um, were mostly, governed by white officers in the beginning almost exclusively over time some black men were promoted to become officers but white men were obviously never governed by black officers so in the middle of 1942 the government began an effort to recruit black soldiers because they realized that it was becoming a problem right this could be a problem the actual improvements that they made were very small, uh, but the effect was really big. I don't think I'm gonna have time to talk about it in the 35 minutes, but maybe we can talk about it afterwards or Stephen will talk about it in the discussion. In 1948, the military desegregated. All right. Let me say a few words about Pearl Harbor. Again, everyone here knows about Pearl Harbor. The, I'll just stick to the relevant things that are relevant for the paper. So Pearl Harbor happened on Sunday morning. It was a surprise attack. No one anticipated it. I know there are, there are theories about whether the government, FDR, the CIA was anticipating it, but in the population, this for the population, this was a big surprise. It happened on Sunday when most Americans were in church. Everybody found out about this by the end of the day, more or less. So this was, the news was immediately heralded in every newspaper, every, on every radio station, and then through every church pulpit across America. And by that afternoon, the U.S. had entered the war on the side of the Allies. Okay, so I want to say something about anticipation. So one thing, you know, one thing is that uh, it's a bit like the perception of the Nazis versus the U.S. With the knowledge of hindsight, uh, things look very different. Hindsight looks very different than uh, things at the time. In hindsight, you know, the U.S. was triumphant after World War II, and it became uh, a global superpower. At the on, so you can think, well, black men who are only ten percent of the U.S. In the end, we could have won the war without uh, black soldiers. This was not the view at the onset. At the onset of the war, who was in a win was very uncertain, right? Um, uh, ally countries like France had given up. Ally countries like Britain was at the brink of collapse economically and politically. The outcome... The U.S. had very limited military capacity, only 1.8 million versus 5.7 million in Japan and 3 million in Germany. And it had never mass mobilized before. 
So this was untested. Now we look back and we say, well, the U.S. is so big. It was an industrial power. Obviously, it was going to be able to beat these guys, you know, within a couple of years time. At the onset, this was not clear at all. And why am I saying this? Because from the perspective, what we care about when we talk about state capacity, you know, how this weakened capacity is, uh, you know, state capacity is the ability of the U.S. government to implement its policies. So what I'm trying to make the point that the U.S. government at the time really felt that it needed Black men to be fully on board. The U.S. government expected a total war that it needed to mobilize all men and later women and all resources, food and industry for the war effort, just like the European countries on both sides. And 10 percent of the population, black men and women were essential and later women were essential for the fight. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the critical turning points for the war were not predicted in 1941 and 1942. The nuclear bomb was not tested until 1945. The Germans were developing it at the same rate and speed as the US. And the Soviets did not push the Germans back until 1943, right? So in the period that we're studying, which is the few months right after Pearl Harbor, the view of the state was that black men were essential for state capacity. Okay. Very quickly about enlistment. So volunteers were allowed until 19, the end of 1942. So we're going to be looking at a period when volunteers are allowed. Uh, the criteria for everyone had already registered for selective service a year or two earlier. Right. And this is important for us because the data that they're being drafted on or that they're being that they're using when they're volunteering these selective service registration cards, they were already filled out several years earlier when selective service was introduced. So the so the men are not fibbing the information on these cards as a response to wanting or not wanting to join the war. OK, the official criteria for being in the army. Uh, is the same for everyone, it's a health test. Um, in practice, the local army boards often discriminated against admitting uh, African-Americans and they often use the health test as a reason. And in addition to discrimination, often African-Americans didn't get in uh, because they did have health problems, right? So black, the black population was poor and had worse health than the white population. So even without discrimination, they were going to not uh, be rejected more often. Okay, so a few things to say about occupation and location. This is very important. The occupation and location of a man in the army after he enlists depends on his education, race, and previous occupation. It doesn't depend on his volunteer status and it doesn't depend on where he comes from. So in total, 10 million men enlisted during World War II. Uh, as a share of population, the black enlistment rate was higher than white, enlist white enlistment rate at the end. Uh, by the end, and black men were, who were, very few black men were allowed into combat. The ones that were, were highly decorated. So again, we're studying an earlier part of the war, before the massive recruitment effort of African Americans into the army. Okay, I just want to say very quickly here, why do we think discrimination would discourage black volunteer military participation? Another way to think about it is, you know, based on the writings of Levi and others, why do men join, why do men join the army? Uh, and then why would discrimination reduce that motivation? So one is it reduces the trust in the government. Another one is it lowers the value to the public good, right? But a war is a national public good. You fight a war to defend a country that provides a lot of public goods, including emotional ones like identity and physical ones like national defense, schools, roads. Discrimination meant that the black population got less of that, so they're going to value the public good less. Um, it increases discrimination in society means that they're going to probably perceive that the army is more discriminatory. And then there is like another literature that talks about how it can weaken national identity and it can even lower self-efficacy, uh, lower the sense of self-efficacy in general civic engagement. 
So all of these things are going to feed into the estimates of uh, that we're going to get. And then the ones that we want to reject is this demand side effect. Earlier, I talked about how racist whiteboards, which some uh, places with higher discrimination may have local army boards that are rejecting black volunteers. Another concern is simply that when Pearl Harbor first happened, the army didn't have enough housing for men, particularly black men, because, it, because historically there were very few black men in the army. So one concern could be that in, in counties with higher discrimination, the, uh, the, the nearby army bases had fewer facilities for black men, so they weren't able to take black men as quickly. So this is another reason why controlling for draft enlistment rate is useful because drafted black men and volunteer black men go into the same barracks. So if the constraint is barracks and training facility, we should see that in draft and volunteer blacks, controlling for volunteer rate controls for this confounding factor. Okay, so let me just check the time. Great, five minutes, six minutes. So I'm going to estimate, start by estimating a simple differences and differences equation. And this is just looking at enlistment rate of race I in county J in week T as a function of a time invariant measure of discrimination in county I, whether Pearl Harbor had already occurred and then I'll control for county fixed effects, which accounts for all time invariant differences across counties like geography, race fixed effects, which accounts for all time invariant differences across race, such as health or literacy or economic opportunities, and then weak fixed effects, which controls for all of the changes week to week that are same, the same for everyone, such as national war propaganda. Now, if discrimination discourages enlistment, I should see that beta is negative, that discrimination, uh, that after Pearl Harbor, this, uh, enlistment rate of Black men are lower in counties with higher discrimination. Okay. But the thing is that there is discrimination for, that there are other things that we want to control for uh, that vary by county in a week. And so it's useful to actually estimate a triple difference. So we do the same difference and difference for white men and we pull it together with a black difference and difference. And for this, you know, when we do this, what we're, what we're allowed to do, the benefit of doing this is that then we can control for county weak fixed effects because there are things that are different across counties, which influences enlistment rate of black men in a, in a, uh, in a way that's changing over time. So for example, economic and demographic differences in a county, right? So some counties are agricultural and some counties are more engaged in manufacturing. When the US enters the war, the economic opportunities are going to be different for the cities with the factories that are going to be engaged in war production than the countryside. So we want to control for that. And we control for that with county weak fixed effects. We also want race weak fixed effects. And the reason we want this is that, you know, things like propaganda and news could have a different degree of penetration for the black population and the white population because of segregation, right? Like they're reading different things. They might, they're hanging out at different places. So news is getting to them in different ways at different rates. And we control for that by with race weak fixed effects. Similarly, we have race county fixed effects. So this is controlling for race specific demographic or economic structure. So in each county, so some counties are more agricultural, some are more industrialized, but in each of those counties, who's farming and who's working in a factory, the composition of blacks and whites might be different. So that's what we are getting at with race weak fixed effects, race county fixed effects. And finally, there are things like demographic and economic opportunities that we can measure for each race, each county, that we can then interact with weak fixed effects. And this allows for us to control for things like the opportunity cost for black men versus white men, how that's different after the war starts. All right, so I'm gonna skip ahead. These are just a lot of details, which I'm happy to talk about. 
So I, I will show you this map. So this is a map of discrimination across counties. The darker it is, the more racism there is. The reason that it's not all blue in the South is that we're demeaning by state fixed effects. So this is variation within the state, right? If we didn't do that demeaning, it would be light up North and just dark blue in the South. But our estimates are exploiting within state variation. So this gives you a sense of what we're doing. Oh, I skipped an important slide. What is our discrimination measure? Our discrimination measure is a principal component index of all of the measures that economic historians have come up with that uh, to measure discrimination that are available at the county level for the whole country. Um, we look at we look to see that we show discrimination is not random. Obviously, we show that it's correlated with a lot of things. And the correlations can be different for black and white populations. I'm gonna go fast through this, but this is the motivation for the, all those fixed effects that we'll control for. All right, this figure is important. This is sort of our main figure. So this is just the raw data, no controls, no regressions, just the data. And I want you to first look at the black line, the black solid line, uh, the black line, this is a sample of black men. And we're measuring, uh, the measure is the number of men enlisted in the army per 100,000 eligible men, uh, right? We know, we determine, we know eligibility by age um, for every county from the population census. All right. And then we divide all the counties in the US into those that are above and below the sample median for discrimination. The solid line, are black men, the solid black men line are black men in counties with high discrimination. And what you see is that it's almost zero, not totally zero, but almost zero. It's negligible before Pearl Harbor. When Pearl Harbor happens, there is a bump. Uh, people are joining. And uh, the bump, you know, it, it's persistent over the next two weeks. When we look at the dashed line, this is black male volunteer rates in counties with lower discrimination. And you see that there is a similar, before the war, it was similarly negligible. Afterwards, there is a bump and the bump up is higher than the high discrimination counties. And again, it's persistent over time. Now let's look at white men, right? When we look at white men, that's the gray line. First, there's a very small difference. The difference between the two types of counties is ne are negligible. Second, after Pearl Harbor, we see a huge rise in both types of counties, always higher than the counties with black than for black men. And this makes sense because they didn't white men didn't face racial discrimination against black men anywhere. So this is so this figure basically tells you the whole story. Uh, if you understand this, given, I'm going to assume that we all understand the figure and, you know, pause a little bit here, and then I'll go quickly over the tables because the tables just formalize what we see here by, you know, putting a standard error around it, adding a lot of controls to make sure that these, uh, our interpretation is not confounded by other stuff. Okay. I'm gonna go through this. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly. One of the things we do is we take data from newspapers and we show that counties with above and below discrimination had similar experienced similar, similar levels of news penetration about the war and army recruitment. So whatever we're finding is not driven by differential news penetration or information. Okay, so for this, let's just go directly to column five. Like I said, this is, I'm only showing you what you already know from the figure. We're showing that the triple interaction, high discrimination, in high discrimination counties, black men have lower volunteer rates relative to white men after Pearl Harbor. And it's robust, it's statistically significant and robust to a lot of fixed effects. All right. On top of the fixed effects, I'm controlling for a lot of things at the county and race level interacted with weak fixed effects. Specifically, it's this list of variables that captures demographic and economic differences between black men and white men in each county. And I'm letting that difference 
uh, the influence of that difference vary over time because they, these things could have affected the opportunity cost of joining the war after the war started. So that's what we're trying to do here. All right. Um, I'm gonna go, this is just telling you that amongst those measures of discrimination in the principal component index, all of the individual components have the same sign of effect, but in terms of statistical precision, we're getting our biggest bang for the buck from the presence of the Ku Klux Klan, democratic vote share for Congress, and log occupational income score differences between black and whites. Okay, we do tons of robustness checks. I'm going to skip it. We also talk about heterogeneous effects, like where is the effect biggest in? And what we're finding is that the effect of discrimination on volunteer rates is very similar across the US. The one difference we see is how far away a county is from Pearl Harbor. The further away from Pearl Harbor, the closer to Pearl Harbor, the less discrimination matters. And this makes sense to us because if you're very close to the war, probably the immediacy of danger and other feelings dominate you know, concerns of discrimination. And then the last set of results I'll show you for the black population is who is selecting to join the army, right? Does, who is discrimination taking out of the army? And what we find is that in places with higher discrimination, there are fewer educated volunteers and fewer volunteers who are who work who are from agricultural uh, have agricultural occupations. Essentially, in places that are with high discrimination, the people who, the black men who are joining are uneducated, um, uneducated black men in urban areas. Right, the higher educated guys. The guys from rural areas are the ones that are deciding not to join because of discrimination. Okay, I'm totally over time. So I'll just tell you that we find similar patterns when we look at Japanese Americans. When we look at Japanese American, uh, this is, they're actually drafted, but uh, I'm happy to talk about it later. They had some discretion over whether they were drafted or not. We find that the rate of joining is much higher in Hawaii where there wasn't internment versus the mainland where they were interred, right? And this is the last thing I'll show you, which is I'm, everyone asked, we were also curious when we did this, if we just looked at all races in the US, what does it look like? So these are all the racial groups we identify in the military induction data. And what we see over time is that, uh, is that right after Pearl Harbor, Japanese men, white men, and Native American men had the highest rates of volunteering. Chinese men had a much lower rate and black men had the lowest rate, which is sort of, again, I'm happy to talk about this later in Q&A. This is sort of consistent to the historical reading of racism and also motivation from other factors, like you know, Japanese men wanting to prove that they were good Americans. Um, yeah, based on our reading. Okay, so let me conclude. So what do the main results show us? They show us that discrimination discouraged black volunteers during World War II. They uh, it reduced US capacity to fight the war. And this highlights a new channel of the social cost of discrimination. The policy implication, it's almost so obvious that I don't even wanna say it, but I guess since we didn't do it, uh, it's not, it wasn't that obvious to some people, if you want citizens to contribute equally to society, you need to treat them equally and give them an equal stake in society, right? I mean, this goes back to very old thinking of how republics and democracies work all the way back to the social contract. And I'm just going to end there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. And as I noted at the, the beginning, we have a formal discussant, and that is Stephen White from Syracuse University. And I'll move it over to Stephen. Okay, well, thanks, Jeff, for inviting me, and thanks, Nancy, for the very interesting paper. So um, I'll probably speak, maybe not 15, maybe more in the five to 10 minute range with some kind of initial comments, and then open it up for kind of a, a larger discussion. So I think there are a lot of, I think, really obvious strengths to the paper. I think as Nancy was describing nice at the very end, this is an important question and a historically interesting question that it's a concern, I think, 
to people across social sciences, not just in economics, but in political science, sociology, historians as well. It's a, I think it's a broad topic of broad interest. And I think the real strength of the paper is the sort of the really careful empirical work, the attention to issues of research design, and particularly questions of uh, causality. So just some questions, comments here. So when I was asked to discuss this paper, I sort of asked myself, what would my value added be here? And it's definitely not econometrics. And so I assume other people in the audience know more about that than me. I'm sure Nancy knows much more about it than me. And so I won't dive that much into that, although in some ways that is kind of the core essence of the paper. It is very much like econometric modeling sort of paper. But I want to offer a few sort of other thoughts. So I'll talk about a few things. One is this issue, this kind of theoretical issue of how legitimate the federal state was or wasn't for Black Americans in the World War II period. I want to sort of inquire further about the alternative explanation of demand side effects. Um, a few small empirical questions, some of which were actually addressed by the talk, so maybe aren't so important. Um, say a little bit about the comparison with other groups, which I think is an interesting way of kind of extending the main analysis. Talk about differences between Black enlistment early on and the fact that it kind of grows pretty quickly, actually, within a year or so after Pearl Harbor. And then I think I'm sort of legally obligated as a political scientist to mention some political science literature on this topic that I think raises some similar theoretical uh, questions and draws connections between this work and those works. So on this theoretical question of legitimacy, and I think you bring this in in the paper talking about the Margaret Levy kind of framework about why you join the military and how discrimination might cut against that. And there's a strong claim made in the paper that the state, the American state, was viewed as sort of illegitimate in the eyes of Black Americans because of discrimination, and that this might motivate them to perhaps not join the military. And I don't want to push this too far, but I want to at least ask whether the legitimacy of the national U.S. regime at this time actually is, whether it actually is so low in relative terms. Um, and so if you think about work by political scientists like Eric Schickler, whose book Racial Realignment comes to mind here, um, since Reconstruction, there had been this sort of decline of Black rights, Black inclusion. But with the New Deal period, you start seeing the Democratic Party changing quite a bit. FDR, who's still president, of course, during World War II, is really quite popular among Black voters. New Deal economic intervention programs are quite popular among Black voters. And you also start seeing in the executive branch bureaucracy, the so-called Black cabinet, providing kinds of uh, at least descriptive representation in the federal government that you really hadn't seen uh, before. And so I don't want to deny the real reasons for there being low legitimacy. Yes, you accurately point out there is persistent and often quite violent uh, racism across the country, not just in the South, but in the North as well. But I wonder if in relative terms, the American government actually is more legitimate in 1941 than it was in 1917 or whenever it was the US uh, entered World War uh, One. So again, a relative question, but just one I wanted to kind of raise there. I wanted to, I guess, ask more about this alternative explanation of demand side effects, because when I first was asked to look at the paper, um, as I was reading the abstract, the first note I wrote down was kind of noting that I had come across all this you know, in my own research, kind of more anecdotal qualitative evidence that you mentioned about people being turned away. And that was sort of what I thought here. And so how you would adjudicate between those two explanations. And I think ultimately for me as a, a reader who's coming at it, maybe less from an econ story and maybe someone who's less uh, fully knowledgeable of some of the econometric work you're doing here, to what extent I should interpret lower enlistment in these high discrimination counties as reflective of black men's true preferences, which I think is the story that you're, you're telling here and versus restrictions on their choices. And I think the argument, as I understand it, is that by sort of looking at the rates when the draft is implemented, you can kind of adjudicate that a little bit. And again, I wanted to at least raise that for discussion for others perhaps, because I, I, I think I sort of understand the logic of that, but it's a relatively small portion of the paper. And I think it is a larger argument that I see in a lot of historical cases. And so I was wondering if there are other ways the story could be true in ways that aren't fully uh, captured here. I also was curious about the role of quotas. My understanding is that there were quotas on black enlistment in the military uh, starting in the late 19th century up through this period. And, you know, certainly in my own work, I came across people who would write article, write letters to their congressmen saying, you know, I tried to volunteer for Pearl Harbor, but I got turned away, that kind of thing. Um, and so again, I, I think the point of your article or your paper, I should say, which I think will soon be an article is to say that empirically that's not the case, that it is mostly the first thing and not those demand side effects. But I, I was curious um, as to sort of more about that. Some smaller empirical questions. The first one here, you actually do. Um, I, I missed it in the paper, but you put it up, I think, very nicely. I was curious how to visualize these counties along low and high discrimination uh, grounds. Although thinking about them as sort of relatively like within state comparisons, I was curious what the kind of aggregate looks like. And so maybe it is just a map where the South is very dark and the Northeast is like much lighter. 
that I was curious if there's other kinds of variation beyond just purely uh, north south. We're not doing it within state, but kind of across state. Um, I wasn't sure how to interpret the distance from Pearl Harbor in Germany in substantive terms. I, I understand what you're saying about distance from the threat being a thing that might weaken discrimination as an effect. But to me, I, I wondered if it's just not capturing regional differences. You know, being far from Hawaii means the South, or at least the East Coast, you know, being close to Germany in theory means that as well. And so there really aren't many Black people at this time living in California. I guess maybe you're capturing people living in the Midwest, maybe. And, and so if the Black population is heavily skewed in the Southeast and the East in general, how do I interpret it substantively, the, the kind of distance from Pearl Harbor thing? Because we'll talk a little bit in the paper about um, Black workers benefiting less from wartime industry than white workers. And I was curious to hear a little bit more about that. There was, of course, in a few, year, a few months before Pearl Harbor, there's the executive order by FDR establishing a Fair Employment Practices Commission to investigate discrimination in war-related industry. And my sense is that there's at least some literature. There's one article here by Collins that is about 20 years old now. And so there may be newer works on that that you're more familiar with than me. But I guess that there was some evidence that it was effective, at least in some places, at making there be opportunities for Black men that didn't exist pre-war. And so I was curious if Black workers actually did have more to gain uh, in some sense. Uh, I think the comparison with other groups is, is really interesting. And I guess I was thinking as I was looking at the kind of story you write in the end there and then kind of the graph you show of different uh, enrollment rates, like how I sort of think about this. Because on the one hand, the, the Japanese American number seems like very large actually initially, like it's higher than whites if I'm reading that correctly, or maybe it's a, some sort of relative, but that seems like quite striking considering the size of the population. Um, and also like kind of thinking about different kinds of discrimination. I'm thinking here about work in history, people like Ellen Wu, who writes about this in The Color of Success, so how Japanese Americans and, and Krebs, and I are, I'll talk about in a second, writes about this, how Japanese Americans are discriminated against in a lot of ways. Then in some ways it's similar to how Black Americans are discriminated against, but there's also this question of loyalty and patriotism that's actually quite different. No one is really seriously considering Black Americans as not being patriotic. They're just you know, a subjugated group. Uh, Japanese Americans in some ways don't face some of the kinds of discrimination that Black Americans do, but they're deemed possibly disloyal and possibly threatening. And those things might lead to kind of, again, this is like a more qualitative thing, but those differences struck me as uh, kind of worth um, investigating more. I was curious about the growth in enlistment. So if I remember correctly, the argument here is that immediately after Pearl Harbor, December 41, black enlistment is quite low, especially in high discrimination counties. But if I remember correctly, I think it's June of 42 when black enlistment becomes higher than white enlistment. And so I, I guess I'm curious if discrimination is so consequential for these early low enl en enlistment rates for Black Americans, particularly in these high discrimination counties, not to say that it didn't require any effort because you talk about how it did require advocacy groups and the federal government doing all kinds of things, but I'm curious why it was so quick to reverse that if it was so consequential. Like why was it so, I don't wanna say overly say it was easy, but why was it so relatively easy to kind of overcome that in only about six months? And then finally, just to kind of briefly throw a few poli sci things at you, there's a few things in, I think both IR, APD, and more behavioral work that, that I was kind of thinking of as I read this. And so I think there's a lot of work in IR, kind of in more constructivist circles about the link between military service and rights. And I think Ronald Krebs has a really interesting book called Fighting for Rights, which compares the military service of black Americans to uh, religious minority groups in Israel. and makes the case that black Americans, kind of along the argument that you're making here, black Americans have not really benefited much from military service. He looks mostly at World War I and then the Cold War, but I think it has a lot of similarities with your theoretical argument. I think the thing that has the most connection with what you're doing here is probably Daniel Kreider's book, Divided Arsenal, which looks at how the federal government during World War II kind of used its policy implements to try to get enough participation along the ways that you're talking about here, but in two kinds of ways. It did things that seemed very inclusive, like the anti-discrimination measures and the wartime industry stuff, but also things that seem very exclusionary, like maintaining segregation and, and things like that. And I think Kreider's point is that the state did both of these things in an effort to kind of have it both ways a little bit, wanting to get Black Americans to serve. But I think the, the other side of that I want to be curious to hear you say more about is, ultimately, they want white people to serve too, and particularly white Southerners. So white Southerners, I think if I remember correctly, volunteer at much higher rates than non-Southern whites. And if the government perceives that Southern whites are extremely opposed to serving with Black men, the government has to kind of, I think, do a little bit of both. You want there to be black men volunteering, but also white men volunteering. And so how you kind of balance that, I think is a tough one. Um, I've written about this as well, a little bit looking at white racial attitudes. And I think particularly looking at the FDR mm -hmm. executive branch stuff. Um, and then I think at the end, you talk about the ways in which other contexts might lead you to think that service for black men who did serve would have led them to be more active in civil rights later on. And so there's an interesting book, I think, by political scientist Christopher Parker, 
uh, called Fighting for Democracy, which looks at some survey evidence and interviews with Black veterans in World War II in Korea, I think kind of making uh, that argument. So again, I think as a political scientist, I'm obligated to throw some political science sites at you. There's a lot of other stuff uh, as well. But yeah, I think overall, like a, a super interesting paper. Um, I don't have the methodological knowledge to fully interrogate the re research design. Those are kind of a, a few questions, and I think others probably have uh, other thoughts and perhaps more ideas on that. But again, thanks very much for the paper, and thanks, Jeff, for the invitation. Absolutely. Nancy, any thoughts on anything Stephen brought up? Yeah, so let me just respond to sure, uh, sure. some of these questions. These are just so great. Um, so I'll just start with the last one about the suggested reading. So thank you so much. We're just going to go ahead and read those books. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I was not aware of them. We looked, but you know, inter uh, interdisciplinary stuff is hard. <laughs> so this is great. Thank you. Um, okay, so these are all really great questions. Uh, okay, so it's unclear. So I'll start from the beginning. Was what was the state in terms of legitimacy for African Americans? right around World War II versus earlier. So some things were better and some things were worse, right? So, um, you know, as we all know, Woodrow Wilson infamously segregated uh, DC and, and brought back a lot, of, um, a lot of racist policies. And so that was, def so things like that were definitely worse than say before World War I. But then other things were better. So you had mentioned quotas. So during World War One, there are race specific quotas that was removed in the uh, that was removed before World War Two. Um, an important, a really important question you brought up was the demand side. I just want to explain a little bit what we're doing. So in this context, the two main demand side forces we're worried about, the two main reasons why, the two main things we're worried about concretely in terms of the army pushing black men out. One is just about capacity, right? Like black men, they just don't have enough barracks and training facilities for black men. And this is particularly problematic in places with high discrimination because those are the places that had fewer black men joining historically. The other one was just, you know, these local army boards sitting there saying no to black men who show up to volunteer. And what we're arguing is that both of those factors should be this should affect people who are drafted the same as black men who volunteer. So by controlling for draft rate, we address that. And what we're doing when we control for draft rates it's almost as if right now we're looking at volunteer rates as the outcome. We can also look at the effect on draft rates, and then we just subtract that out of the effect for volunteer rates, and that's how we get our results. So that's kind of like how we're thinking about it in the econometric modeling. Um, another clarification, a couple of clarification issues, is this: the results of being close or further away Japan we have state fixed effects. So the comparison are of counties closer to Japan and further away from Japan within the state, right? So we're not comparing Hawaii or California to Massachusetts. We're comparing counties um, to the west versus the east of California, or actually it would be like diagonally, southwest versus northeast of California. Um, the FEPC is really important. It started in 1941. It made things a little bit better for African Americans. It didn't change in the window that we're looking at. So I don't think that's driving the results, but it's definitely part of the, it's an important part of the context. Um, a really important point, a question you brought up was about what happened in June 19, around, you know, middle of 1942. This is something that we've been very interested in. So, and I saw a question, this is related to a question that Jeff asked in the window I saw, which is about, you know, was there, what do I mean when I said that there are more Black uh, African American volunteers than Black volunteers? I'm not talking about total number of men, obviously, because there's many more, Blacks are only 10% of the eligible men. I meant as a rate. So as a rate of uh, per eligible men, black volunteer rate was higher than white volunteer rate uh, in total. Uh, and that was solely driven by the second half of 1942. Now, here's the interesting thing. It all happens in the low discrimination counties. So I think we actually have a figure in the draft. I'm not sure. I don't have it in my slides. But what we see is that 
And in the second half of 1942, high discrimination counties continue on as before in the sense that black enlistment rate just stays negligible, low. Uh, low discrimination counties, black volunteer rates just go up and up and up. And then the question is, why is that, right? And we don't have a sharp ident we don't have a sharp model to tell you with the data what it is. Historically, a lot, a bunch of things happened. Uh, so the US government started to target its campaign towards African Americans to recruit them starting in 19, uh, starting March and April. And you know, what does it mean? It means that there were uh, Doris Miller. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the mess man who was on the USS Arizona. So he was a mess man. He was working in the mess hall when, uh, when Pearl Harbor happened. And because the soldiers, the white soldiers banding the cannons were all gunned down, he ran out and started shooting and he survived. So he was a national hero and he wasn't well known before this. But for the campaign, you know, they published photos of him everywhere. He went on tours around the country recruiting African-American soldiers. And there were also some talks of establishing Black combat troops. But in reality, it was pretty negligible what they did. I mean, maybe it wasn't clear what would happen. But at the end of the day, you know, there was a couple of um, fighting divisions in each military unit, but not much. And in terms of discrimination, anecdotally, there's... No, we didn't come across any anecdotal evidence as discrimination in the army actually got better. Um, so we see, I think there's two ways of explaining the uptick. One is to say, well, this massive propaganda campaign, and also the US started to do better in the war, like the, uh, the Battle of Midway was hap happened in June. So one thing is to say that this is like an emotional response. You know, they see, um, People are pretty worked up. They're pretty patriotic. They want to fight. And the only thing holding them back was this fear that they were, you know, the army didn't want them. They see that the army wants them and they rush in. And this, another one, and this isn't instead of, in addition, there's also just the economic explanation, which is that, you know, on average, black men are much poorer than white men because of discrimination. So the opportunity cost of joining the army is going to be much lower. And those war industry jobs that came along later in 1942, there was several papers showing that they strongly discriminated against black men. They were disproportionately allocated to white men. And so black that, you know, that emphasizes this point that the black men have less to lose by joining the army because their outside opportunities are bad. So they just really joined. And I think to us, this isn't a very sharp explanation, but this makes the, the this makes the low volunteer rate the continued low volunteer rate from the high discrimination counties all the more stark because it just shows how much discrimination mattered in terms of discouraging men from joining the army. Um, yeah, I think that's everything else were just great points and things that we need to think about. I think that's all I had to say in terms of responses to Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I have a few that I typed in as well. So you, you mentioned the first one, right? The, just the, the, the factual question about, you know, and, and, and that's great. So I, you use kind of white as a baseline, right? And my first, I, I was just kind of wondering, you know, was there discrimination within whites, right? Because we know that you're fighting Axis powers, right, in Italy and Germany. And I just wonder if there was any way to get at that particular question, right? Did, did people who had, you know, obvious sounding surnames that, you know, German or Italian, did they face discrimination? And I'm not sure that you were able to, or, or, or you entertain that at all. Yeah, so we didn't look into that. I mean, we should. I think actually, uh, well, you're going to give me the chat, right? From the, I'll get to <laughs> in the chat. So I'm not going to waste time. Everyone's no, no, don't right write anything down. down. I will copy okay, it. Okay, so yeah. that's a great idea. Um, we haven't done it, mostly just because of bandwidth. We just uh, haven't been able to get to it. And, but what, so one thing to keep in mind, though, is that there was, this happened a lot in World War One, right? I mean, we know this. The eight million German American Germans, uh, people of German extract in America, face huge amounts of discrimination. So Vicky Fuka has several really interesting papers about this. And one of the things that had happened is that they changed their names, and this as an outcome of the discrimination. So we're a little bit wary about using names because it's almost like you know if you're 
I don't think many Germans have the name Adolf Hitler, but this is like an extreme example. If you're a German immigrant who has the misfortune of being named Adolf Hitler, if you're still named Adolf Hitler at the beginning of the war and the induction card, that's a choice. And I don't know how to think about that. Um, I still think it's really interesting, right? And one of like, but that's something that we haven't looked into and we should look into it. Anecdotally, you don't, or just in terms of the historical narratives, we actually haven't come across much of this uh, or any of this for World War II. For World War I, there's a lot of discussions about this. Should I just move down to your next question? Yeah, the one about the newspapers. I'm just curious if you yeah. use African-American newspapers. Yeah. We did. So African-American newspapers are in our pool. And we actually looked at the coverage of the war between African-American newspapers and white newspapers. In terms of front page mentions and just, you know, having a front page headlines or like any article at all, it's the same. They do differ in terms of word length and the, the, the amount of coverage, right? So, uh, so every newspaper every day for the next eight weeks after Pearl Harbor had a front page story about Pearl Harbor across America, almost without exception. But if you look at the length of all articles about World War II, as a fraction of total uh, pages or total word count, African-American newspapers gave it less coverage. And to us, this made a lot of sense because the African-American community was more ambivalent about the war in the beginning, but the war was very big news. So they covered it in the front page. Okay, okay. So then I had a kind of a broader question about what, is, what does state capacity actually mean when you fight a war? Right. You, you need troops. Right. You need people, you know, essentially people in the field to fight the war. But you also need materials. Right. You need planes and tanks and guns and things like that. You need foodstuffs, you need all kinds of supply chains. Um, and then that kind of leads to my basic understanding is that there was this, you know, this the second great migration happens during the Second World War. Right. Where you have all of this. You have black Americans from the south moving to the north. And, and again, the kind of the, the narrative is that. Uh, the wages are better, um, discrimination is less, and the factories needed manpower, right? And this is maybe before, you know, Rosie the Riveter and you begin to use women. Um, so one question would be, you know, to the extent that that's true, um, is it the case that you don't have uh, Black men in high discrimination counties in the South um, enlisting they're essentially moving north for better opportunities, better economic opportunities. Um, and then one way to think about that, I suppose, would be if you actually track some via the census, where did where did they actually live? Right. I mean, do you know that those high discrim you know black black men in those high discrimination counties are actually still there in the first few months of 1942? Right. I mean, are they you know, you know, are they not enlisting because they're somewhere else? They've moved somewhere else. So I don't know if you could use, you know, census data actually begin to track some people, you know, over, you know, from the 40s to the 50s to see where they're actually living or not. Yeah, that's super interesting. So we can't track anyone after 1940 because that's the last year where we can give names. I think in a few years, we'll get 1950. Yeah. Um, I have another paper that linked black men. It's notoriously hard. We're, able, we're only able to link 8% of the sample reliably. But then just going to your uh, substantive question about the Great Migration, that actually happened the decade before. One of the nice things, it's just luck by luck. Uh, World, War, World War II happens right after the 1940 census. And the 1940 is the one census that asked people where they live in 1935. So we don't need to track them. Like it's in the census. So we can see where people are coming from. It doesn't answer your question of where people go to after the war, but we know where people move from before the war. And, um, and that allows us to do a couple of things. One, it's not in the paper, we're working on this now, we just got new results. One of the really neat things is we can put, pe we can look at people, put people back to where they were in 1935 and look at the discrimination in those places and calculate a measure of discrimination that immigrants to a county bring with them and see if that matters or not, as much as the discrimination of like county I. Uh, and it does, it turns out that it matters a lot 
the discrim uh, which sort of makes sense, right? These are the social norms and perceptions people bring with them when they moved here five years ago. Uh, but the thing that you're saying about different opportunities that we're actually controlling for, because for each county, we can calculate with a 1940 census, uh, occupation, education, age for black men and white men separately, right? And this usually proxies for their economic opportunities. And then we can control for the interactions of each of these variables with weak fixed effects. So if these opportunities change over time because of the war or whatever is happening, and that those changes are different for each race in each county, we're controlling for all of that. And, and I wanna say some, this is related to something that Steven said also, I mean, your general question about what constitutes state capacity, it's related to one, uh, one of Stephen's point, which is about black men and efficacy, right? You know, conditional on society being conditional on white men, not wanting to be with black men or feeling a lot of hostility. You know, does it, uh, ex ante, it might make sense to keep black men out of the army. So I think, I think that's a, I think that we agree with that. Like ex ante, it wasn't clear from, and you know, the historical discussions talk about this a lot. You know, FDR and Eleanor and Eleanor Roosevelt, especially, you know, were known for their very progressive views on a race. Um, they did not want to keep black men out of the army because of their own beliefs. It was the Southern generals pushing for it. And the argument was, look, you bring in black men and white men will rebel. They won't fight. If you put them on the, it's sort of what people said about women, you know, like later decades. If you put them on the front lines together, we're going to lose because we're going to dysfunction, right? So ex ante, it wasn't clear what the best way to go, conditional on racism. So just to follow up, do you know, do you know for sure that there wasn't significant migration from south to the north in the six months after Pearl Harbor? Not that anyone knows of. I mean, not that anyone has talked about. Okay. So one quite another question would be what what does what was the formal procedure to enlist? And is that different in different parts of the country? And different right. for the races. Mm -hmm. Um Oh, and just and just so you know, Jeff, like when we measure the induction cards, your lo the location of your induction card where you live, that was registered in 1940. So if you, Jeff, moved from Oplica, Alabama in 1940, where you did your selective service to Chicago, when you go into the army, you show up as Oplica. Okay. And, and you, sorry, and you have to go to Oplica to get into the army. You have to get, you can only enlist where you registered for selective service. Okay. So this doesn't go against your concern, but I just wanted to clarify the background a little bit. So I think your concern is that what if everyone from Apaika went to Chicago? So it's not that they don't want to uh, enlist, but they're just not in Apaika okay. anymore. Um, and that is something that, uh, we don't do anything about, but let me think about it. Okay. Would, would literacy rates be meaningful here at all in terms of, you know, there, there's gonna be a difference between whites and blacks in the South in terms of literacy. That's their ability to, you know, perhaps read newspapers, perhaps, you know, read the back of their card to, mm -hmm. to figure out how to enlist. I mean, I, you could talk to different people, right? And maybe, you know, there's a common understanding of how to do some of these things. But would that matter at all in your mind? Yeah, it's actually really interesting. So econometrically, we control for literacy rates, the differences in literacy rates between whites and blacks for every county. So that's not driving the results. But it's really interesting because when we look at who's getting, who's choosing to not enlist because of discrimination, it's the literate black men. So it's the educated literate black men who's saying no. And this is really interesting because um, it's consistent with this view from political science. As you know, uh, there's, this, there's, there's a bunch of studies showing that uh, more educated people, uh, at least statistically, seem to be more active politically, right? They're the ones who decide to take a stand. This isn't right, you know, we have rights. 
So we thought that was a really interesting result. I mean, part of your question about media and literacy makes me think about this issue of how Black paper is covered. The war and a variation within Black papers, because some Black papers, I think, especially pre-Pearl Harbor, we're talking about along the lines you were mentioning, Nancy, about, you know, Hitler and Jim Crow are just two sides of the same coin, blah, blah, blah. But over time, there came to be this, like, double V rhetoric that certain Black papers start pushing that you should fight Hitler and Jim Crow at the same time, and yeah. that fighting Hitler helps you fight Jim Crow. But then other papers presumably didn't do that. And so there might be variation in papers, which are very regional at this time. And so I feel, you know, Pittsburgh, I think, is very much in that line. But I don't know, like, what's Baltimore doing? And also, it seems like this is an era when something like 75% of Black people live in the South still. It's very, very high. And Mm -hmm. I don't know of a lot of Black Southern papers. Maybe I'm just missing them. But I suspect this is mostly a Northern phenomenon that, like, Baltimore, Philly, Pittsburgh, New York are the places where they have large papers. And so for the majority, the vast majority of Black men who are living in the South, are there Black papers? Like, are, are they no. able to read them? It's yeah, only you a small minority on, you can read them, right? So You hit on five really good points all at once. So, uh, so double V happened. And that's one of the things that was happening in like March that was slowly, you know, building up to kind of and fed into why, you know, the increase in Black uh, enlistment in the second half of the year. And it's important to note because we didn't put this in the paper because it was just, you know it was too much for the paper. But it's important to note because, as you pointed out, all of these the double V was mostly a newspaper campaign like the Pittsburgh Courier, and these were mostly northern newspapers and northern cities that had lower discrimination, right? So again, maybe that's why we see the uptick in volunteer enlistment of blacks in places with low discrimination. Um, It was a Black intelligentsia who are reading Black newspapers. In the newspaper.com database, there's only 13 Black newspapers. I think that's because there was only 13. Sometimes small towns would have a Black paper for a little bit of time, but there there were very few Black newspapers that were like consistently publishing over a long period of time. Most Black men, uh, most people were getting, most Black people were getting their news from the radio and from church. So then we collected data on radio penetration for the whole country, thinking maybe we can use that. I mean, there's no black radio versus white radio. All radio was white radio. It's, there's only a few stations. They would have some like black shows, you know, um, black programs. So then we thought, well, maybe we can use ra- variation in radio penetration to see if that tells us something about the trans- the mechanisms. We got the data. There's actually not that much variation in newspaper tra- uh, and radio transmission, it's pretty pervasive throughout the entire United States, even rural areas, uh, I should say populated parts of the United States. So there just wasn't much difference that we could work with. So a lot of the a lot of the black men in the South were sharecroppers, right? Mm -hmm. Did the people did sort of the white owners on the land pressure them not to enlist? And maybe that would be, maybe that would fall under discrimination, but it would be something, right? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. So we do find, right, because we find that farmers aren't enlisting. Um, so I just, I don't know. I can't, I should look into it. I haven't, but, I haven't seen an account of it, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yeah. Just a, a quick clarifying question. Are white farmers, am I to take it that white farmers are enlisting, but black farmers are not? Is that the basic stylized fact here yeah so white farmers are enlisting it's only in relative are, terms yes. relatively speaking okay so that could that could be a sharecropper effect essentially right which could be a different which could be a form of discrimination right something um, right but it tells us exactly how discrimination is yeah. transpiring but it may not necessarily be related to some of the things in the index that you have right it's not clear for example that a, a, a county with a high lynching rate would necessarily influence the, uh, the, the degree to which white landowners would put pressure on black sharecroppers. That's right. It'll show up in occupational income score because if it's a county with a lot of white landowners and black sharecroppers, that'll show up as whites making uh, having a much higher occupational income score than blacks. So that it'll be, so we, so that could be part of what we're getting. So your you're, 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 you're sort of your discrimination index, it's kind of a persistent story, right? Is that the way to think about this a bit? Is it, so, is it a legacy? Is it a legacy variable? 
in effect? Right now, it's everything. And that's one of the things we're working on. So right now, that measure captures what people are seeing in 1940, seeing and feeling, and also what their parents felt or what they felt like 20 years ago. Uh, because the measures are from 1940, but a lot of those things, as you point out, are persistent from the past. So what we're trying to do now, and I don't know if we're going to be successful, is some of those measures, well, two measures, the vote shares, the Democratic vote shares, we actually have for every election year. So we're going to try to see, we're going to try to break it up and see, you know, if elections in recent years matter more than past years or vice versa. What does that mean? It might not work. What does what does matter more mean in that respect? Oh, just whether so say a, a higher vote share for the Democrats reflects more discrimination. I mean that's how it's kept, that's how the measure works now. So we'll be able right now we're looking at average vote uh, vote share for Democrats averaged across all elections from 1910 to 1940. We can separately look at 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940 and see if the vote shares for, for Democrats in 1940 are reduce Black enlistment more than Democratic vote shares in 1910. Okay. I mean, we are talking about a one-party South, right? I mean, we are talking about a, a, a part of the country that doesn't really have a second real party during all of that time. So our results are, we're looking at, our results are driven by within state variation. So as long as there's variation across in the vote share, like the Democrats will win every county, like in a Southern state, but by the, the margin will vary across counties. So as long as that margin is meaningful, we'll find something, but you're right. We might not find anything. We're not like super optimistic about this. I guess I was curious also here on that point about democratic vote share, and maybe Jeff has more knowledge on this than me, but I guess I'm, I absolutely buy that as a measure of discrimination in the South. I guess it's not as clear to me that it's a measure in New York or Pennsylvania that voting democratic in 1930 in Pennsylvania doesn't necessarily mean quite the same thing. And so I don't know outside of the South if it is a, a good proxy. I mean, the party historically had that tie, but it's more of a party of like urban machines and Catholics and immigrants, and it's a little bit of a different thing in the North, right? So I think if you're measuring it, it's within state variation. I don't know if it actually means parts of New York are more democratic or more racist than parts of New York that are less democratic, if that's how I'm yeah, understanding this. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I don't know. We can look at that. I haven't thought about that. We can just break it down. Since we're exploiting within state variation, when we show that democratic vote share matters, we can just break the country down to different regions and see where it's mattering. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, I would look at the 11 states of the ex-Confederacy, for example, yeah. as, uh, you know, um, but yeah, I think that's a good point. Well, we're almost at time. Uh, either of you have any final thoughts at all? I think it's a really fun paper. I mean, as I was kind of, I mean, as I, as I read the paper, as I, as I listen to you, uh, I'm thinking, man, that's a lot of work for one paper. <laughs> yeah. are, there, are you hoping to get more, more out of this project than the single paper? Are there kind of peripheral questions that you're hoping to answer in subsequent work? Yeah, you know, I so so thank you for re recognizing the amount of work. Sadly, <laughs> this is like pretty like average for empirical, at least from from my projects. But maybe I take too long with them. Um, so one thing we really we don't we may not be able to do it with the data, but um, one thing we want to do. So we just found online that you can get the you can get the discharge records of every single person in the army up until like 1960. And the discharge records tells you like what they did in the army. Like the, it's like the whole personnel history. And one thing we wanted to do is sort of like a similar exercise, but to see what, what people were doing in the army in terms of like promotions and our actions. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, there's this idea, you know, in 1948, Truman desegregated the army and going to Jeff's a question, like ex ante, we didn't know if putting white men and black men together would be good or bad. Even ex post, we're not sure because, you know, now it's fine, but social morals have also changed, social norms. So I think that these are all things that we can look at with the data potentially once we get the discharge records. And the problem with the discharge records is there was a big fire that burned 80% of the records, so they're just gone. So there's 20% left. 
And we just need to see, like, basically we need to figure out how they were stored. So the 20% there are left, is that like cover, you know, yeah. big parts of the U.S. or is it all from like rural Mississippi? Well, the good thing is that the, the fire kind of burned randomly. Right. That's the hope. <laughs> um, and I guess the other thing is, you know, uh, we're really interested in civil rights uh, and whether fighting, you know, the after World War One and World War Two, a lot of the Southern racist white groups were like, uh, you know, you'll excuse my super terrible term, but this is what people said. They were like, black men are going to fight and they're going to come back and not know their place and be uppity. Right. But a buddy is good because it means that they're going to fight for civil rights. Yeah. And so that's something we want to see, right? What the narrative says is that double V, double V meant like you go fight victory abroad and you come home and you fight for victory at home. We would love to see if that actually happened. Like if the people, the black men who were sent abroad, especially those who are randomly assigned to combat, if they came back and became leaders and help organize civil rights, particularly the violent side of civil rights. Yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm sure that's probably true. Uh, one and definitely look at the Parker, Parker is fighting for democracy on that point. He has some survey data and interviews uh, along mm -hmm. those exact questions. Yeah, it, this is not a new question at all. We just have to <laughs> we can look at the data. Yeah. So one little piece of factoid that I know of is that uh, at least uh, during World War II, uh, soldier voting was a, was an issue that was um, discussed in Congress and. Uh, there was a real concern among white segregationists that they would lose control over their ability to prevent black Americans from voting because there was a federal movement to allow soldiers anywhere in the country to vote. Um, so you might be able to get voting records to see to what extent um, black and white voters actually were able to vote during World War II and the degree oh, to which they took it. advantage of this. Uh, that's super thing. interesting. Yeah. We can also see if the counties that had more black men go off when after the war, if they had higher turnout. Yeah, for sure. And I just wonder to what extent, you know, do we see, do we, do we imagine that blacks on return uh, after the war uh, went home at the same rates that white did? Did they, did they migrate? Did they go you know, did they go back home and, deal, and have to deal with Jim Crow or did they just simply go you know, move to the north. So, I mean, there are lots of potential questions, I think, to, to examine if you can get those uh, those discharge records. Yeah, so the discharge records won't tell us that because it just tells them that's like it's like the opposite of the induction card. It's all army data. We really need the 1950 census. Yeah, yeah so you and, have to wait um, a few years. <laughs> or like the VA data could in principle give it to you, but vet benefits I, I, that's just something we need to know about. I mean, maybe just, you know, in the army bureaucracy, there was some aspect that, you know, that meant that people were registering and they were keeping track of people and we can get that data. Okay. I'll, I'll send you some sites as well. Stephen, yeah, that would be some, great. And Stephen, maybe you could send, send her your, your PowerPoints because Please. she probably didn't, she probably didn't write everything down as quickly. And I, I saved the chat so I can send that to you as well. Thank you. Uh, but we're, we're about at time. Um, I thank Nancy and I thank Stephen for a, a great workshop. And this, this is, you know, this overlaps a little bit with my interests. And I know it overlaps with Stephen's interests. And uh, you know, I just find it really fascinating. And the amount of data and the amount of time that you put into this project is, is pretty impressive. And I'm, I'm glad that we had the chance to showcase it here on the Pipe Workshop. Thank so you, thank you yeah. both. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for, for providing a little time on Tuesday afternoon. And uh, I'll let you both know when it is up and recorded. And thanks again. Have thank a good you. rest of your day. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Paper. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.